Well, I guess we can start. Uh, I would like to welcome Professor Frankie Rosen from the University of Nottingham, the School of Pharmacy. Uh, I probably should read the whole thing you, you uh, mentioned. In any case, uh, uh, he has been awarded in, two, in 2016 the Nottingham Research Fellowship and also uh, in 2018 the EPSRC Healthcare Technology Ch Challenge. And he has raised in the work that he's going to show um, like a three and a half million pounds on the efforts on developing electrochemical-based bioelectronic tools for the application of developing medicines. Basically, he's interacting uh, electric fields with the biological systems and trying to tune cell behavior or modulating the chemical reactions within the cell. Uh, this is a very short presentation. I think he will, he will do better <laughs> during the talk. So if anybody wishes to talk with him after the talk, uh, and after the questions, uh, he has written the, the email. I also have it, so you can contact him. Normally, this is done in person, but now we are doing it in these telematic ways, but feel free to, to do it, okay? So please, Frankie, as sure. you wish. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> Thanks for the lovely introduction. So just a thank you to uh, Professor Neves for the invitation to come and talk. And I'm really excited to share my area of science with you. More so, I got excited when I saw some work that um, Professor Neves was doing. So I got in touch and this is why I'm here. I'm really excited to be talking with you about, about this work. Okay, so I'm gonna start with the take home messages that I hope I can communicate through the talk. But the, the take home messages are that bipolar electrochemistry can be interfaced with living systems and we can, um, develop new applications, one of which is highlighted possibly on the right. So this is um, what I class as when I made it in science. So I've read The New Scientist, which is a general science magazine since the age of 16. And they picked up some of my work recently in 2019, in which we published around the area of electricity and cancer. Secondly, I want you to hopefully get how bipolar, bipolar electrodes interact with electricity in biology, but more importantly, the understanding of how electricity interacts with biology and those bipolar electrodes, I think, needs a lot of attention in order to understand how we can use these systems. And then probably rather ambitiously, but I'm convinced we're in this new, new era, we're entering a new era in the central dogma of biology, which is not just DNA, it's based on bioelectricity. So rather differently, I've got a bit of an extended um, introduction to my talk, because I want to really place a context of why I'm looking at using bipolar electrochemistry um, in biological systems. And I think to understand that, I've got to um, give you a brief overview of the journey I've been on in the science I've seen, which got me interested in doing research in this area. So I apologize for particularly David, if you've seen this before, but I think this is a really important video to start with. And I start with it in a lot of my talks. So hopefully it works. So you might be wondering why I'm showing you a video of my, um, well, two of my children. I've got three. These are my two youngest. So there's a really important take home message here. Their crazy behavior is in part governed by electrical behavior inherent in biology. So there's electrical signals going from their brain to their muscles to control them. And what I really want you to get from this is actually it's not just neuronal cells that are electrically active in biology but all cells, every single cell in your body is electrically active. So through understanding that electrical behavior, it really gives rise to um, new capability, ultimately of modulating biology. And I'd love to modulate their biology and make them a little bit less crazy. So importantly, biology 
is inherently electrical in nature. So the example of the uh, brain is that it relies on the movement of charge down membranes, plasma membranes of cells that ultimately control those muscles and those dances seen on the previous slide. But we're now entering an era where through understanding those electrical signals, particularly um, brain signals in more detail, we're starting to develop new bioelectronic medicines. And this is the merging of electronics with biology to input electricity to modulate the cellular electrical torque to control disease, which in disease is a malfunctioning in that electrical torque. And I just put a picture of this uh, really state-of-the-art device that's now in late clinical stage um, tests. It's a vagal nerve stimulator and the community is using this for treating a whole host of different diseases. But I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in the coming slides. So what, what electricity is, is native to biology? What, what, what is the endogenous bioelectricity that we can, we can study, we can look at, and we can try and modulate to control biology? So we have these cell membranes. So all, all cells have a membrane potential. There's a voltage that crosses the membrane. And in particular, on the top, top left-hand um, diagram, we know, for example, in cancers, every tumor has a slightly different membrane resting potential. And we know that that voltage is intrinsic in the disease state. And again, I'll talk more about this in the coming slides. We also have in C, electric fields. So this is essentially thinking about Coulomb's law. It's how charged particles interact, generating force fields, and how those force fields then actuate biology. And then Importantly, on the bottom two pictures, we have ion currents. So this is currents generated through currents generated through ion channels, which alter the concentration of bulk ions, which generates that voltage gradient across a plasma membrane. And then on the right, you have an example of a Faradayic process, a redox reaction in which free electrons are also important in modulating cell function in disease state. And we've done a, quite a bit of work on these redox processes and free electrons, Faradayic currents, and understanding how they underpin cancer cell behavior. So I mentioned at the start of the talk that we're moving into an era of um, thinking about biology in the context of DNA being the central dogma is no longer true, which sounds rather um, grandiose, but the, if you go and look at the literature, this, 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 is, this is a fact now. It just needs taking time for the community to catch up. So if we think of what a computer is, we think of a hardware, we think of a microchip that's um, your processor in that computer, and then people develop software to modulate various programs such as such as zoom well we're moving to an era now where we now know that essentially we can start of thinking of biology as integrated networks we have the hardware which is the dna and then we have the software which is the electrical signals that are tuned within the biology for example you can think of voltage gated ion channels so these are ion channels that are uh, whose ion flux is modulated through local potential changes as a transistor, similar to a transistor in a chip, which stores those noughts and ones and pro enables software to be programmed. And we're now starting to realize that by finely tuning these transistors, you can ultimately modulate the transcription and translation of your DNA and therefore your proteins. And this is what essentially is demonstrated in the bottom left-hand corner in the context of a positive feedback loop in which ultimately bioelectricity modulates how your genes are transcribed. And the pioneer in this field, or one of the pioneers in this field, and I encourage you to go and look at his work, is Mike Levin from Tufts University. But what this really indicates is that we must start thinking about biology, not solely as biochemistry, but as integrated electrical circuits. So on the top left, we've got a diagram from this reference here by Newman. And essentially 
we can model an action potential, uh, sorry, a neuron cell, and model the circuitry which results in a downward um, movement or a forward movement of membrane voltage and current moving down the nerve. But also, in the work that we've published and are studying, we inherently know that these bioelectrical circuits are important in underpinning disease state, particularly in cancer. And you don't need to know these um, electrical circuits in detail, but what we're starting to now realize is that if we understand the cell as an integrated um, blob of biological circuits, so think your house, think wiring of your house and the electrical circuits in your house, by modulating electrical input with switches, we can start to control these electrical relays and therefore program your biology and modulate it. And we're working on this and others are working on this to develop treatments for cancer and other diseases. So this might sound like science fiction, but I want to show you this slide to show you how important bioelectricity is in an, a cancer that we particularly focus on, glioblastoma, which is a brain cancer. So on the top left, in 2019, there was two seminal nature papers published, which demonstrate that a glioma, a brain cancer cell, listens in on your electrical communication between healthy neuronal cells. And they showed this by using voltage sensitive fluorescent dyes, which is hopefully you can see in the videos. But importantly, what they demonstrated was that the ability of your glioma to electrically sense and alter its electrical properties enhanced the progression of the disease. So what this demonstrates is if you can carefully tune these bioelectrical signals, you can alter and treat this disease, which is a new therapeutic paradigm. Um, this is an example of modulating ionic currents. And on the right is some work that we've done where we also realized but in the context of Faraday currents, so redox currents, that these redox currents are vitally important in the progression of cancer. So there's a real opportunity here that if we can modulate carefully bioelectrical circuitry, we can modulate underlying biology. So this, this, this slide basically summarizes what I just said. If we can input and modulate electrical relays, we can modulate and control biology. But the challenge is we're really, really poor at being able to interface devices or drugs to modulate those individual electrical relays on a cellular level. So we think, or I think, <laughs> that we need new tools to drive the advancement in electrical molecular communication so we can control those bioelectrical circuits, which ultimately controls the transcription and translation of DNA, and therefore we can control and reprogram cellular behavior. So now just want to give a couple of slides and context to the state of the art of bioelectrical medicine. So bioelectrical medicine or electroceuticals as it's termed, sounds re rather revolutionary. It's not as revolutionary as it sounds. So you probably are familiar with some of them. So you may have heard of the cochlear implant, so it's a hearing device that enables people who are deaf to um, for their hearing to be restored. But there's also the pacemaker in the heart and deep brain stimulators that you may be more familiar with. But we're getting much more clever in developing that technology. And when I moved to Nottingham in 2013, I moved on a independent fellowship that I was lucky enough to be awarded. And I was proposing to look at new electrochemical devices to look, sense bioelectricity. And just at the same time in 2013, you had these two seminal nature articles published, which turned and coined the term electroceuticals. So this is the ability to input electricity into biology to alter the cell signaling and therefore treat disease. This has then really taken off with Google partnering with um, Google or ABC and spinning off a company and they've invested about 500 million pounds over the coming years and they're really close now to spinning off their first examples of bioelectronic medicine which are based on not solely but largely the most um, common um, 
widespread media focused example, which is a vagal nerve stimulator. So you can think as, of the vagal nerve as the M1 highway or your, your main motorway in Spain, and it links your brain to all your organs. And essentially, that's how your brain modulates um, homeostasis, so biological control. And what Kevin Tracy at the Feinstein Institute over in America realized was there's a reflex arc. So just like if you hit your knee and there's a spontaneous automatic movement of your leg, there's also a reflex arc that you have no control over, it's autonomous, that modulates your immune system. And what he realized is, is if you could modulate the electrical relays that tell your immune system to switch on or off, you could treat a whole host of diseases. So he developed this vagal nerve device, which is an implantable device. It sits around your vagal nerve and sends out electrical pulses. And those electrical pulses essentially regulate the amount of acetylcholine and um, cytokines, which are chemicals that modulate your um, immune system. And this has been used to treat, for example, um, arthritis, gut inflammation, and essentially any disease that is underpinned by inflammation, this device can help in that fight. So it's a really exciting time. Then more closely related to some of our research is there's some really exciting new therapeutics that are actually used now on the market, both in America and in Germany. They're not here on the um, NHS because it's too currently too costly. But this is essentially the first breakthrough in a treatment for glioblastoma in 30 odd years. Essentially, you wear this cap and this cap um, sends out a uh, electrical frequency of approximately between 200 to 500 kilohertz. And it's been clinically shown to, it doesn't cure glioblastoma, but it extends life significantly. And the mechanism is, is wide reaching, summarized in this diagram and the paper that I cite at the bottom. But essentially the main, the main mechanism is thought to be A, which is an antimitotic effect. When you, send, when, when you apply this electrical stimulus, there's an electrical field that they claim gets inside the cell and inhibits how your mitotic spindles form inside your cell during cell division to pull your chromosomes apart. So it slows, they think, cell proliferation, causing cell death. But there's also a whole host of other observed phenomena and um, biological mechanisms which are thought to play a part in this tumor treating field being used as an effective treatment for glioblastoma. But I raise a question. So they apply a, an electrical frequency of 200 to 500 kilohertz. And if you go to this bottom left figure and the appropriate citation, what they show in this, uh, in this review article is that in order for an electric field to penetrate and bypass the membrane, you have to be higher than kilohertz region. Essentially, you want to be in the megahertz region or times 10 to the 10. So I raise a question about what is a triggering mechanism of how tumor treating fields work. And I raise a question that actually we, we, whilst these biological phenomena are observed and linked to the tumor treating fields, I think there's an initial switch that we're missing that actually, based on the fact that I don't believe this uh, frequency of electric field is getting inside the cell, is stimulating the membrane. And these are downstream cell signaling events that cause this treatment to work. Okay, so I've given you a whistle-stop tour of the field of um, the importance of bioelectricity, where the state-of-the-art bioelectronic medicine is. And I'm slightly biased because I'm involved in the research. I've painted it as a wonderful um, technology that's going to revolutionize medicine. And whilst I think that's the true, there's some major obstacles to um, ensuring that bioelectronic-based medicines are taken up more broadly to treat other diseases rather than being niche treatments. And their problem lies in the examples here. So we have a resolution issue. How can you target individual neuronal relays in your brain? We have an invasive issue. Apart from the tumor treating field example, most other bioelectronic devices require in, um, invasive surgery to implant an electrical device within the biology. And that's because you need the seamless integration of your device with the biology for the um, electrical input to work. 
So I believe we need to move to a situation where we, if we want this uh, medis type of medicine to become more broad, you have to be able to put your electrical input externally, such as the tumor treating fields. There's biocompatibility issues. So every few years, these electrodes degrade, the devices break, you have to go and um, re-implant a new device. And this is really pertinent to my family currently. So we've just been diagnosed as having an hereditary disorder called um, a heart disorder, which results in sudden infant death. So luckily I don't have the gene, but my brother does and his three daughters have had to have these devices implanted into their hearts and they've got to have them re uh, replaced in a matter of a year and a half time. So, you know, what, whenever surgery is key to taking this uh, technology forward, I think it's going to be a barrier to more broad use. And then importantly, there's a real lack of technology and understanding of how these bioelectrical circuits interplay. So when you look at the literature, people will focus on one ion channel, for example, the sodium potassium pump and the current associated with that. They might focus on one redox enzyme. But actually, we know from a systems biology point of view, it's the overarching interplay of all these um, functions that govern the behavior. And I think until we move to a situation where we can understand accurately individual bioelectrical circuits and modulate them with new tools, it's going to be a barrier. But that said, the light switch went on in my brain when I saw a talk in 2014 at a conference by Robert Foster, actually, who's also involved in the area. And I believe that bipolar or BPE, bipolar electrochemistry or electrodes, are possibly a way to develop new wireless technology to actuate cell behavior and therefore develop new treatments. So you'd be glad to know that my extended introduction is complete, but I, I thought it was important to place the work in context why I'm doing this. So a question, how can we reprogram and sense cellular electricity? So I'm just gonna spend a couple of slides telling you where the state of the art is. So on the left is some work that we published in um, 2012 or finally published in 2013, appeared online in 2012 in which we had to physically stick nanoneedles inside a cell to measure some unique bioelectrical signatures. This behavior or, or similar technology, but based on field effect transistors, which Professor Lieber at Harvard has pioneered, also takes a similar approach, but not from a Faraday perspective. They're measuring action potentials with these nano field effect transistors. And then we have also these um, lifetime fluorescent imaging of these membrane potentials so we can link how membrane potential underpins, for example, cancer cell function. But that said, the problem with the top two is you need to physically pierce the membrane and you need external circuitry that links those electrodes to the internal environment. So realistically, this makes this technology really difficult to adapt and translate. Again, here's some really nice work that's been done in the context of wiring intracellular cells to measure electrochemical redox events. So what I realized when I went to Robert Forster's talk in 2014 is that we could potentially use um, bipolar electrodes to avoid the, necess the necessity to pierce those plasma membranes and have external circuitry. So how are we actually actuating this behavior? So we've got some work from my host, Professor Nives on the right. So we can interface um, cells and biology with devices and alter the electrical input to control neuronal cell behavior, for example. We've got the central example of the work by Bentley, and he's regularly publishing um, advancements in this area in the context of how we can modulate Faradaic current. So you modulate a redox probe, which ultimately tailors a transcription and translation of some genes to alter cell function. And then finally, you have the example in our review article that's exemplified by the vagal nerve stimulator that I've already covered. Okay, so I think bipolar electrochemistry can play a key part in interfacing and sensing and actuating this cellular electrical torque with the idea that we can use this to modulate cell behavior. So what is bipolar electrochemistry? So bipolar electrochemistry relies on a conductive object being placed essentially between two feeder electrodes, a capacitor, but without a physical wired connection. 
that said, it does have an electrolyte solution placed between the Faradaic, uh, between the feeder electrode, sorry. When you poise a potential across a capacitor, the bipolar electrode exemplified where I'm highlighting polarizes in the field. So it becomes negatively and po positively charged on the ends. This generates a voltage gradient across that um, bipolar electrode, which we can use to drive Faraday reactions. The magnitude of the current generated at the bipolar electrode is dependent on the potential at the feeder electrodes, the distance between the feeder electrodes, and also the shape and size of your um, bipolar electrode. But this equation is explicitly for a channel bipolar electrode system, and I don't think this necessarily applies in some of the work that I'm going to discuss. You can model the circuitry of these, and one of the pioneers of bipolar electrochemistry, Cooks and Kuhn, have done this. And it's being used in all sorts of applications, from biosensors to electrosynthesis, photoelectrochemical cells, and in our current work, and Robert Forster's current work, and, and until recently, I wasn't aware of Professor Neve's work, Professor Neve's work now, we're starting to realize you can use this for the goal of modulating biology. But there's problems. The problem is classically using these equations in order to particularly drive voltages at small electrodes, the voltages have to be extremely high, which are actually high enough to do damage to your cells. So there's a question there, how do you actually integrate these bipolar electrochemical systems when you need high voltages, it's challenging. How do you get to the lo location in biology to work? And how do you ensure that the current flows through the bipolar electrode and not through the solution? So lots of challenges to address in order to use them for the purpose that I want them to do. But we've started this journey now. So our aim is to develop new biomaterials and nano bipolar ele electrodes for use in wireless biometric bioelectronic systems. Okay, so on to the first bit of work, which was um, performed largely by Paula, uh, Paula Samuel Alberta with other members of the group and collaborators, which I'll get on to. But our initial goal was to see if we could do some simple experiments to prove that bipolar electrochemistry could um, be driven at nano electrodes but at relatively low voltages to that said that should be used in the literature. So we took a inkjet printed electrode system highlighted here, and we took gold nanoparticles, placed it in a solution of palladium chloride and applied approximately uh, 100 volts. And well and, well and behold, what we observed when we put these particles under um, SEM and uh, scan electron micro microscope and transmission ele electron microscope. We see this um, deposition and we did some EDX analysis to show that this deposit with palladium suggesting that we were wirelessly driving this electrochemistry seen at the surface of the gold. But really importantly, if we use the equations that I've mentioned already to predict the voltage that we needed to drive this electrochemistry, they claimed that you needed kilovolts. And we were doing this at 100 volts. So clearly still quite high, but much further away from what is theoretically proposed in the literature. So we also wanted to provide further evidence, therefore, that these um, gold nanoparticles were acting as basically antennae. They were sensing the electrical input between these two feeder electrodes and polarizing. So the electrical state of the nanoparticle was changing. So we perform dark field microscopy, and this is essentially where you look at the scattering or the backscattering of light in a, in a microscope. And we know that the backscattering of light at individual nanoparticles is affected by the electrical surface charge on the particle. And if you look at C, that's an individual nanoparticle and demonstrates using Fourier transform analysis that the charge is different when you apply a frequency of four hertz in this case. So this demonstrates that at low voltages, the nanoparticles are sensing that voltage and the electrical surface properties are changing, indicating that what we're seeing is electrochemical reduction of palladium. And we'll come back to this. 
I was then lucky enough that Professor Luisa Perez Garcia moved to Nottingham and is now moved back to uh, Barcelona. And, and we started working together. Um, and Luisa uh, was doing research with these nanoparticles at the time. So what we realized is that these particles could be a really cool way of looking at this bipolar electrochemical effect inside cells on the nanoscale because this zinc porphyrin on the end is fluorescent. And it, we also know from the electrochemistry literature, literature that this zinc porphyrin is electrochemically active. So its redox state changes or can change if you apply sufficient voltage. So before we get to that, though, we have to make sure that we characterize the particles um, sufficiently well to prove that we have the particles that Louisa um, had fabricated. So we did a whole host of different studies uh, from UV vis spectroscopy to analyzing the fluorescence through to TM and SEM. But essentially, all the data indicates that these particles are functionalized with this, this peridium and the zinc porphyrin in the way that we envisaged. And importantly, it's fluorescently active. So on, on graph D, just to note, which is an interesting observation, that you'll see in green, we have the gold modified nanoparticles with the zinc porphyrin. And in black, the fluorescent signal associated with the zinc porphyrin in solution without nanoparticles. And you'll see we get this fluorescent signal, an inversion in the wavelength at 610 versus what about 675. And we, we suspect this is because there's an alteration in the electrical configuration on the surface of the nanoparticle, which alters the fluorescence. But the key thing is they are fluorescent. And I'll get onto this in a second. The fluorescence changes when the, um, when the zinc porphyrin's redox chain state changes. So we took these nanoparticles and we put them inside Chinese hamster ovary cells in D, which are fluorescently labeled. And when we applied a external voltage of approximately, I think it was 190 volts, which is really high, by the way, too high to do this for extended periods. What we observed was that the fluorescence change and we did cell total corrected fluorescence to show there's a significant difference, which we postulated was because we were um, altering the redox state of the zinc porphyrin. So to prove that further, we attached the zinc porphyrin to an electrode and performed cyclic voltammetry. When in the presence of zinc and without the presence of zinc, and what we demonstrate, because we got, we got a question from the reviewers that how do you know this is not just a potential sensitive dye and it's not linked to redox. So when we looked at the cyclic voltammetry, and this is where you scan through a, um, a voltage and measure the resulting current with time, and we measured the fluorescence, you'll see this fluorescence, dropping fluorescence signal here, coincided with the reduction of the porphyrin here. So we postulated here, this was evidence that this change in fluorescence was not because of a potential sensitivity, but because of a redox state change in the porphyrin. So we've, we believe this was the first example of a wirelessly induced redox state change inside the cell. So thinking back to the introduction, well, if we can start modulating bioelectrical circuits inside the cell from outside, you can start to think about a vision in the way in the future this is of how we could develop technology to do this in biology, but from an external perspective. So this diagram was the, uh, the, the, the talk image for the paper, but sums up lovely why this is actually a really, well, I would say an important discovery, because what it means is you've got a really neat tool um, that utilizes bipolar electrochemistry and the gold nanoparticles acting as nano, nano antennae because they sense the uh, uh, electrical um, voltage induced and reports by altering the fluorescence. And, you know, this not only could you apply this for the applications that I mentioned in the int introduction, you could start thinking about then using this as intracellular biosensors as well. So it's really, really quite an exciting observation. However, the previous example, we were still using volts and the cell, um, cell viability, if you poised the voltage for long periods of time, essentially killed the cell. So we're still not a voltage friendly um, 
application to actually use this in biology and reality. So I had a really talented engineer come and join the group, Andy Robinson, now Dr. Andy Robinson after recently passing her viva. And she really delved the teeth into the understanding more accurately how these gold particles behave when you input an electrical stimulus. And why is that important? Essentially, if your bipolar electrodes are in a salt solution, electrical current will favor the pathway to least electrical resistance. So therefore, the electrical current will flow through the solution and not through your bipolar electrode, so you wouldn't see a redox change. The graph on the right surmises the model that we introduced and essentially is a tool to predict when eta is a sufficient ratio, when the impedance, the electrical resistivity of the bipolar electrode over the electrolyte is above times 10 to the three, you would start to see current flowing solely through the bipolar electrode or this region in between where you'd get current both through the bipolar electrode and through the solution. But importantly, this is a nice design tool for trying to think about when bipolar elect electrodes will work in biology, because biology is inherently an electrolyte. There's a salt, a, a, um, a, a salts around your cells and inside your cells. So what Andy did, she took these nanoparticles of varying sizes and placed them inside and outside cells. And then we looked at using impedance spectroscopy. So impedance spectroscopy is a tool to look at electrical resistance. The only difference with impedance is that it's proportional to the frequency of your electrical input, where electrical, uh, electrical resistance in direct current isn't, which is why you get a frequency linked phenomena. And we were amazed when we did the impedance spectroscopy and modeled the circuits on this uh, in, impedance spectroscopy results. And at really high gold electrode um, concentrations inside the cell, we saw differences in this capacitor one. So what that essentially meant was that when we were applying the external field between the feeder electrodes, the gold was sensing that electrical input. So this is evidence again that at high frequencies, and this only happened at high frequencies, electrical frequencies that is, your nanoparticles are able to sense and change with that electrical input. So that was really exciting because when we started thinking, again, thinking about the fact that we have these um, bioelectrical circuits inside the cell, when we polarize these gold nanoparticles inside the cell, you will have local electric field effects. And would those effects change the biology? So what we did, or what preliminary work Andy did, was took different nanoparticles, polypyrrole and gold. She applied an electrical stimulation and not electrical stimulation in the absence of no particles and used a fluorescent um, cell viability dye or cell metabolism dye to look at the effect of cell metabolism. And what was really exciting was that when we applied our potential, both with the polypyrrole and gold, we saw a reduction in fluorescence, which indicates that the cell behavior, the cell metabolism is reducing due to our electrical stimulus being felt at the nanoparticles. So this was really exciting. So we started thinking about the tumor treating field example that we mentioned earlier on. Could we get enhanced effects in that tumor treating field effect by localizing the electric fields using these conductive nano antennae? So Andy leaves. I have a really talented postdoc, Akil Jane, joined the group, co-supervised with David and Louisa. And we have a talented uh, CD, a CDT PhD student recently start. And we start collaborating with um, a clinician called Stuart Smith. And he, he leads the, uh, or the brain cancer clinical team here and collaborates with Novacure who are the um, company that have translated the tumor treating fields. And they have this in vitro device here. And this represents an in vitro example of the cap I showed you on the earlier slide. 
and you place your cells inside and you input an electrical stimulus at that 200 to 500 kilohertz region. And really excitingly, but also slightly unexplained, which I'll get into, we took a human patient derived um, glioblastoma cell line, GIN28. The GIN represents glioblastoma invasive margin tumors. The reason glioblastoma is essentially a death sentence is because the primary mechanism of treating it is through surgery. They go in and I've, I've sat in um, and watched Stuart perform this operation on a patient. They cut out the tumor, but then you're left with residual cells that you can't get rid of. So it always grows back and eventually leads to death. Even in the presence of um, it, it, synergistic effect of um, tumor treating fields and also chemotherapeutic agents. But when we applied this in vitro test, if you look at the black, which is your control, and your red is your classical tumor treating field effect. So this is well documented in the literature. You get cell death because of all those reasons I mentioned earlier. But in the presence of our two conductive nanoparticles, which were a gold nanoparticle, a semiconducting particle, zinc oxide, but then this is where it gets confusing. Theoretically, a non-conductive particle, silica oxide, we see an enhanced reduction in metabolic activity, indicating, I initially thought, that the cell, the nano antennae are polarizing and you get local electric field effects interfering with cell processes causing cell death. There's a problem though. The SiO2 nanoparticle is a really high resistance particle and shouldn't polarize in the field. So clearly there's a link with an electrical effect because you only see it in the presence of the electrical stimulation. But what's exactly happening with these nanoparticles, we're not sure. We need to do more work. But it's promised that you get an enhanced killing effect with these nanoparticles presented. So it's really exciting. So we're currently um, in discussion with Novacure to take this further forward as a possible add-on to their um, to their tumor treating field technology, but that's the early discussions at this stage. Okay. So in the example I showed earlier, in which I showed um, the front cover of the new scientist, we published um, a couple of papers demonstrating that cancer cells modulate their function through transferring free electrons from inside the cell to outside. And we showed that if you alter those um, signaling pathways, that uh, free electron transfer across the membrane, you alter the behavior of the cancer cell. So we started thinking about, OK, how could we develop a system to modulate membrane electron transfer wirelessly, which would tune the cancer cell biology? So again, I had a really talented uh, postdoctoral researcher, Jacqueline Hicks, who was also my very first PhD student um, at the University of Nottingham. And she undertook uh, this batch of work in which we started to use carbon nanotubes as bipolar electrodes to modulate electron flux across um, both biological membrane-like membranes, but also biological membranes, which I'll talk, talk about now. So I should have added Lawrence Livermore on here. So this work has been performed with, um, in collaboration with Lawrence Livermore and Professor Alex Noy. And Alex has pioneered um, the use of carbon nanotubes as porins in vesicles and cells. And Jacqueline went and spent some time in Alex's group to learn how to, how to make these CNTPs, these carbon nanotube porins. And the method is highlighted here and is uh, published in the paper that was on the previous slide. But essentially, you take, you take carbon nanotubes, single walled, you perform a sonication procedure in the presence of um, a lipid solution, and the lipids wrap around the carbon nanotubes, ultimately forming these liposome structures with carbon nanotube porins in. And our theory was twofold. Can we get carbon nanotube porins into the plasma membrane of neuronal cells? And if you can, when you poise a potential, 
between two feeder electrodes and the CNTPs are acting as bipolar electrodes, would they polarize? Would this drive electron transfer through the CNTPs? And also, because Alex Noy has shown that you can transport ions through these, these channels, would it also alter the transportation of ions across a membrane, altering not only the free electron transport, but the membrane potential? So you could possibly stimulate an action potential. We're also applying this to cancer cells in the group now to modulate cancer cell behavior based on those free electron transfer events and alterations in membrane potential. So the first task was to prove that we had these CNTPs, carbon nanotube porins, in a liposome. So we used carbonoamide coupling chemistry to functionalize the carbon nanotubes. So we could fluorescently image the um, sampling of the carbon nanotubes when placed through a chromatography column. And this data shows that at an absorbance of 1,000, which represents the CNTPs, we get a peak on the 10th fraction. And we also get a peak at about 495 nanometers on the 10th fraction, representing the fluorescence associated with the 6-amino fluorescein. We also used other analytical techniques to prove that the CNTs were actually there. So we were comfortable we had a working method to produce these liposomes. So it's one thing basically replicating what Alex could, Alex's lab can do quite um, comfortably on, a, on an annual basis and publish amazing papers. Could we then contribute something in the context of bipolar electrochemistry? So our quite crude method, and we're working on more better methods now to prove this, was could we take these liposomes and cells containing these CNTPs and utilize gold reduction as a marker that bipolar electrochemistry was being driven on application of an external voltage. So again, this is just supporting data to show that the CNTPs are definitely in the liposomes. So on, on the top left, you just have fluorescent micro, microscopy images, and I must say beautiful images at that, of the um, CNTPs, which are fluorescent green on the bottom left. And then we had a um, rhodamine dye for the uh, lipid. Then when you co-localize them, you can see they overlay nicely. So good piece of evidence, CNTPs are in the um, vesicle membrane. And I'm going well over time. So in three minutes, I'll finish wherever I am. <laughs> um, we have bottom left, we have an example of um, confo confocal microscopy showing the, uh, the CNTPs localized in the membrane. We've done some transmission electron microscopy as well to show that we, uh, we could image these CNTPs in the membrane. So we believe we had them there. We then performed a voltage study demonstrating um, if we saw this gold reduction in the presence and absence of the carbon nanotube porins with the vesicles. And you can see there's a significant difference in the deposition of the gold at the membrane interface, particularly at the low voltages. At the high voltages without the CNTPs, you still see agglomerates, but we put this down to what's happening at the feeder electrodes, and they're not co-localized with, the, um, with the vesicles. And we, co we confirm this with EDX analysis using scanning electrochemical microscopy. And then the piece de resistance, on the top left, we provided further evidence that bipolar electrochemistry was happening. On C, you've got one vesicle with a gold deposit that you can see. And then on E and F and D, which I think are really important um, examples of proving bipolar electrochemistry, when we use the um, fluorescein dye, when you get deposition of the gold at the tips of the CNTs, P's, you get quenching in that um, in that fluorescence. And importantly, if you think about this aligning in the field, it only happens at one end. Tying into the theory that these align in the electric field and are only redox reactions are polarized on one end of the, um, of the vesicle. But just a take home message. If you, again, if you do the application of the equations in the literature, it suggests that you need high voltages. Even if you, class the liposome, which is micron sized in examples as the total bipolar electrode, you still needed quite a high voltage of three volts. The CNTPs needed 1.2 kilovolts, but we're seeing it at much lower potentials. 
So we did some basic um, Cosmo modeling to indicate that actually with the CNTPs in the membrane, you get an enhanced localized electric field effect at the tips of the CNTPs, which is why you're seeing this at lower potentials and predicted, which means that the bipolar electric chemical theory, we think, needs to um, be analyzed again to take this phenomena into account. I'm just gonna skip through the next few slides because I think I'm getting to time and leave time for questions. But essentially, you can, you can use this similar technology to grow electronics in situ. So we've used um, bipolar electrochemistry to grow silver wires. We demonstrated that these silver wires form functional circuitry by the lighting up of the light. And then we've applied this to biology. In inter and this is the first example of in situ grown electronics using wireless electrochemistry. But then importantly, we used it for a, a, a use. We sensed a redox event using these wires. We've also now taken this technology further forward to look at 3D cancer spheroid models and altering their behavior using this technology. And then I'm just going to finish, I'll skip to the final slide. So in this work, we what we did was we took a three dimensional scaffold printed using two photon lithography. We controlled topography and the electrical properties of the material. And we differentiated stem cells into cardiomyocytes. And we, what we did, we looked at how we could drive them to, to a mature status, which can't currently be done in vitro. And on the last slide, we achieved that. You look at the sarcomere length of um, heart cells. So heart cells have these striations so they can contract. And we compared in the presence of the printed material alone, the present of the material printed with electrical stimulation, the present with the application of bipolar electrodes in the absence and presence of the electrical stimulation. And what we demonstrate was that the electrical stimulation in combination with the bipolar electrodes caused an enhanced maturation effect in the cells. And then just to finish off, linking into some of uh, Professor Neve's work and others, what hasn't been looked at is bipolar effects when you place stru conductive structures and grow cells on them in electric fields. And this is just a, an exemplar um, diagram that showed when we did this in bipolar electrodes, the electrical input and the magnitude of the input and the frequency you needed to drive differentiation and maturation of stem cell derived cardiomyocytes altered. And this indicates that bipolar electrodes can affect cardiomyocyte differentiation and beating. So I'm going to finish there because I've slightly overrun, but in conclusion, Hopefully you've seen bipolar electrochemistry can be used in living systems, but there needs a lot more work. How electricity behaves at the nanoscale in abiotic biotic interfaces requires more studies to understand how the electrical input affects it. And work I haven't discussed, but stay tuned because hopefully we'll publish soon. We're actually using this technology to develop a, um, a medicine. So it's really exciting. I can't finish without saying, I'm just a bit spoke part in this cross-disciplinary team. I've had really talented students, which I've highlighted the key members who've done the work throughout. There's a really um, great team here at Nottingham and now in Barcelona, I'm still collaborating with in the, co in the context of Louisa and David. They've supported this work. And more importantly, the image of Alex on the top right at Lawrence Livermore, who's enabled this CNTP work to happen. And then more importantly, an awful lot of information in that talk. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Frankie. <laughs> well, there are so many variables that these uh, uh, many questions can raise. Uh, so I, I better let people say, if, do you have any questions? Yes. I have a few. <laughs> Far away. <laughs> Can I just start with one or you want? So uh, thank you very much for this uh, amazing talk. Um, I have many, many questions, many things that I don't really uh, um, fully understand. But one that is very intriguing to me is that you show the effect on the metabolism of cells. 
yep. of nanoparticles acting as antenna. Yep. And do you have any idea of why an electrical signal will affect the metabolism of a cell? I mean, it's an effect that is uh, affecting what does, which aspect of the metabolism is affected by, by an electric field? So in answer, I can't, but I can give you some hints. Um, I think we need a lot more work to understand exactly what's happening. But what we, what we can say, if we use a tumor treating field um, example as um, an idea, is that in their example, when they apply the electric fields, they, they have data to indicate that proteins in biology wobble in the field. And for example, that means they might not be able to partake in the function that I highlighted of aligning the mitotic spindles to separate. Now, what I think is, is so if you, if you think of this more holistically, that's an example of an electric field interfering with biomachinery. If you have these nanoparticles inside the cell and there's a lo local electric field around the nanoparticle, whatever machinery they're next to, I believe they'll interfere with. What that machinery is, I mean, there's so many different types, right? So the, the argument is, can we be more clever in tuning the properties of those electrical particles to target? But that's a whole, yeah, whole, whole other area, of course. I can go ahead and ask uh, one question. Uh, you are talking about mat maturation and differentiation of cells, but yeah. did you see uh, direction that is? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, I, I skipped. Yeah, I skipped through it really quick because I know I was short of time. So I apologize for including too many. Okay, so we've got two, two, two examples. This is one with a 3D printed groove structures. On the right, you've got them aligning in the grooves. Also, then if we look at the cell aspect ratio of these cells in the presence of the grooves, you'll see on the right hand side, you get an enhanced um, phenotypic looking like cardiomyocyte. So in summary, yes, we do. And then again, even more excessive here when we include in the Petra material, which is the biomaterial developed by one of my colleagues, Morgan Alexander, you get even more enhanced um, alignment with the, with the microgrooves. And also, do you see a difference with the material? Because we did see that gold behaves different than polypyrrole or P dot or iridium. So even, yeah. even with the same induced field, you, yep. you have different directions and speeds. And So we never, look, we never looked at the directions. What we largely looked at was the sarcomere length, uh, which is, oh, I've got to get the right, the right figure. Ooh, it was the one previous. Here, this one. So we looked at, so these striations you can see in the fluorescent imaging. So we know that to get a mature cardiomyocyte, these should be 2.4 micrometers, which we're actually getting close to. And if you compare the Petri stim versus the Petri stim with the multi-wall nanotubes with and without, you do see differences. Uh, you know, so I think there are material differences. So what we're doing now in the group, we're trying to work out the hierarchy of all these signals. So we understand more carefully what signal does what and how. Uh, I have an additional one. Yeah. <laughs> if, if an external field can induce uh, a dipole in the <laughs> electrode, can a neuron also induce a dipole in the, in the material and then get a feedback as we, we thought we yeah. saw it in, with depression? Yeah, exactly that, um, Neves. So what, what we... What we, what we talk about in the paper small where we've published that work, we talk about actually the liposomes, for example, act, being, acting as bipolar um, electrodes themselves. So the same will be true for the, for the uh, neuronal cells. Of course, you've done much more work on that in the context of understanding that. So, but it, you know, this is why it's really exciting because I think you know, the literature is there to show you can use these systems. So it's, it's really exciting. It's like we are opening the a Pandora box and we don't know what is going to come <laughs> indeed, out. Indeed, <laughs> indeed. Eventually. Well, I don't know if there are more, more questions or... Well, thank you a lot, Frankie, for your presence in the distance and your availability. Uh, anyway, thank you. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank, thanks for listening. Thank you. Bye-bye.